traditional super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. Hope you are doing well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition. Traditional homestead living, traditional raw milk products, and artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. Hey, everybody. I am back from my podcast vacation. It has been three months since I recorded anything. Uh, Scott and I were both very, very busy, and the things that kept that keep the homestead financially solvent they become front and center for us. And it's been good. It's now it's good to be right here, back in front of the microphone again. So let me take a minute, say welcome to all the new listeners. The subscriber numbers continue to go up, even though I was absent. And again, thank you so much. And a big welcome back to the veteran homestead-loving regulars who stopped by the Farmcast for every episode. I so truly appreciate each and every one of you. I'm not sure how much I'm going to include in today's episode. As I said, it has been three months, and a whole lot of stuff has happened in that time. Uh, so we'll, uh, as usual, start with the homestead life updates, and that's actually all I'm going to get to today. There won't be any other special topics, just the homestead updates, because, hey, it's been three months. There are a lot of them. And um, those of you that are members of our Locals.com community, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about you will probably already have seen or heard, because thanks to Scott, he posts weekly about the cows and the creamery. Um, he milks the cows, works with the cows a lot, and of course he's building that creamery stick by stick by himself. So if you'd like to hear his perspective, go to peacefulheartfarm.locals.com and join our community. It's free to sign up, and we also have specific data that is for subscribers only. So um, any anyone can read, watch, and listen, but only subscribers can comment on the posts. And they can also make posts of their own to the community, start conversations with each other, and so on. I believe the minimum fee is $5 per month to subscribe, uh, though you can support, support us at whatever level you choose. Some people pay way more than that, and man, are we appreciative. And again, you can read, watch, and listen to anything uh, that's public for free. I do have a few things that are for subscribers only so that they get their a little bit more of their money's worth than just supporting us. Though we do appreciate people who just support us because they want to. We love you. Uh, and a shout out and a huge thank you to all of those of our local supporters. You really help us keep going. And again, those of you interested in more of this content, the address is peacefulheartfarm.locals.com. All right, let's start with the cows. That is the centerpiece of our operation as a small dairy and creamery. And so breeding season uh, with artificial insemination began the last week of May. And August, when I last published a podcast, we had one confirmed pregnancy with a second AI procedure in progress. So they'd been inseminated but not verified that they're pregnant. And we were waiting on the preg confirmation the first week of September. So today, and this is November, we still have only one confirmed pregnancy. And the last AI appointment for this cycle was completed about three weeks ago. So we did do one final AI uh, three weeks ago. We have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on this AI price, uh, process. And I believe there have been a total of three tries, as I said, and we have to work with the vet's schedule. So the time frames have stretched long. That's how we've gotten this far. Now, the second attempt produced three or four additional pregnancies. And we had set up the third AI appointment to try and get the four remaining cows impregnate, impregnated. But that uh, second attempt, the girls were preg checked with ultrasound. And th again, three or four of them were confirmed. I can't remember if it was three or four. However, before the next AI session where we would get the remaining four, all of them aborted. And these aborts were likely related to a spirochete infection that is spread via deer urine. And there's a treatment for it. So we uh, treated all of the cows. You, you treat them 
as they're um, getting inseminated and then I think in the seventh month of their pregnancy because this spirochete causes these early, early term abortions and also a late term abortion can happen uh, with with this spirochete. So we treated all the cows and then scheduled the next AI appointment and so we had to start all over again. Again, <laughs> we had to, got to get them cycling all at the same time and time just kept moving forward. And here we are in November, still only one confirmed pregnancy that third attempt is completed and the vet is scheduled to come a few days after Thanksgiving to see where we stand and what that's one of the reasons that this has stretched so long is that the vet waits I believe it's 65 days or so to be able to confirm pregnancy with ultrasound before we try again so uh, she wants to be sure even though we could see these cows come into heat and they were like okay these are not pregnant but we waited on her this is the procedure that we set up and right now, the last time where we tried seven of them again, I believe it was seven, um, we already know that only two have not come into heat again. Five have been bred by Ferdinand. We can tell you, we can tell because of what are called heat stickers. If they get mounted, the stickers are rubbed clean and the underlying fluorescent orange becomes visible. And that means possibly two out of the seven on this last try still have solid heat stickers with no orange showing. Now, so why do we keep saying this is the last try? Well, that's because we finally bit the bullet and bought the bull I just mentioned. We purchased Ferdinand about a month ago. He is a gorgeous Guernsey bull. And of course, this is not ideal because our plan is to have 100% registered Normandy dairy herd, but we had to do something just to get the calves so, so the cows could be in milk. So we have to get these cows pregnant. Uh, we can't support the herd shares and make cheese without lactating cows. And we don't have lactating cows if they don't give birth to calves ever so often. Uh, even if we are able to continue milking them past what we normally would, their milk production always continually, uh, continuously declines. It peaks at about two or three months and then just declines until eventually they stop producing milk at all. The farther they get from the delivery, the less milk that they give. And um, we actually don't know how long that they'll produce milk before they naturally dry up. Some uh, people have said their cows will dry up around automatically by, at around 12 months. And others say they've had calves uh, lactate for two years. And there are outliers that even go beyond that. But I'm, somewhere between one and two years, I think, is pretty, pretty average. So we may just find the answer to that question for our girls in the very near future because we're just going to keep milking right on through. Um, so the bottom line is that Ferdinand will get our girls pregnant and we will have milk in the fall of 2023. Uh, most of the calves out of Ferdinand will be sold as they won't add to our goal of 100% Normandy herd. Uh, I believe I've talked about our particular plan was always to have calves in the spring and not milk in the winter. And as you can tell, what I just said, that plan is completely turned on its head. We may end up uh, milking year-round for a little while. And I'm not going to explain the details of that here, uh, but it requires going without calves again for more than a year to get everything back on track. So it, it may work out just fine. It will take time. Again, keeping up with the herd shares and having milk to make cheese is the priority, whatever it takes. Otherwise, we simply cannot remain financially viable. Now, on the upside, we have a registered purebred Normandy bull named Nickel that was born in April this year. And we kept him intact because a neighbor wanted to buy him after he was weaned. And uh, in the end, we backed out of that sale because we do actually live and learn. We will keep Nickel around for at least two or three years, perhaps more, before replacing him with another. Now, Ferdinand's probably going to... Uh, He's breeding them now, and then he'll probably have another chance next year uh, as we expect Nickel to be still too small to uh, actually get the job done. So it was a good idea on paper to not keep a bull around and feed him hay through the winter for just two months of work in the early summer. So AI seemed the best way to go. And to be sure, we have not given up on that completely. Uh, however, our AI experience has shown us the necessity of keeping a bull just in case. Uh, the first two years we used AI, I believe we had about a 50% success rate on the first try, and that's actually pretty average sometimes according to the stats. Uh, but this last go-around has been a nightmare, a very costly nightmare 
and uh, so where do we go from here? Well, the plan is for Scott to learn how to do AI himself, and there are workshops available, and he'll be attending one sometime in the future. Um, it looks like actually in December he might get a chance to attend one of these, and then he'll be able to practice on our cows uh, even before they need him. So I'm sure he's going to be very good at this task. He has a strong medical background, so when they start talking about the anatomy and physiology, he'll be able to keep up with that uh, very well. And right now, <laughs> he's still very busy with the creamery, and <laughs> more on that later. And uh, with the bull we have right now, we're good to go for breeding at this point. And so as we get to the place in our journey where Scott can act quickly, to, when a cow comes into heat and we're not reliant on the vet to perform the procedure, I believe AI will once again be a good fit for our operation. But as I said, we will still keep a bull on hand. A bull is going to be needed if we expect to keep our calving season in a specific window of time. And uh, But with him knowing how to do it, he can jump in there and do the artificial insemination himself immediately when he sees one of those cows come into heat. And that is the key. Okay, okay, enough about the cows. We love our cows, though. <laughs> All right, let, let's talk about the dogs. Have I got a story for you regarding the dogs? It's pretty wild, and I'm going to start where I left off, but stay until the end. About a week ago, something crazy happened. So, we started with three livestock guardian dogs. Mac was born and raised with sheep and cows, and then his owners sold all their livestock, and Mac needed a new home. Uh, so we took him on, and Charlotte and Finn were guarding chickens and turkeys, and their owners also decided to get out of the business. So uh, let's talk about Mac first. Um, as I mentioned several times, Mac's a great dog, but f he, he's food or resource aggressive, what's called resource aggressive. Um, he gets very aggressive around any of the animals that come near him while he's eating. In the last episode, I talked about trying to get him to bond with the sheep and getting the sheep to be okay with them in their space, and I talked about how he barked and growled at them to keep them away from his food. Well, that situation actually escalated a bit because Charlotte also became food aggressive, and the two of them went at each other's throats twice before I separated them. See, it was just with the other animals. So uh, Finn disappeared, and... That I'll, I'll talk about more uh, about that in a little bit. And Charlotte ended up hanging out with Mac and the sheep. Uh, she was with Finn, obviously. Finn and Charlotte went together, almost like Hansel and Gretel, Jack and Jill. But um, Charlotte ended up hanging with Mac. Um, she didn't really like being alone. So we put them together. And the first time there was an incident, I saw Mac go to Charlotte's bowl. And this was several weeks after they were together maybe even a month or more, and he was finished eating, and she was goofing off with a little treat a few feet away from her bowl, and she saw him invade her bowl. She went after him. It was pretty intense for about maybe five or ten seconds, not very long, really. Uh, she won that battle, and I thought it was over, but then fast forward uh, a few weeks, and they have now been moved a couple of times to this pasture and that pasture. I never saw any more of that behavior. They go with the sheep when the sheep need to move. So we've moved them around. They're all back in paddock number eight when it happened again. And this time, Charlotte tried to eat out of Mac's bowl. Um, I bring the bowls out there, set them in their two separate places, and then they come up and they eat their bowls. But she went to his bowl instead of her bowl. They went at it again for five or ten seconds. She won again. and It's a really scary thing to see. They definitely meant business. And the next day, when I came out with his bowl, put it in his usual place, he wouldn't approach his bowl. And I knew that was wrong. So, quick consultation and a post to the Livestock Guardian Dog Training Facebook page. I was informed that they were both now food aggressive and needed to be fed separately or it would end badly with one of them cowed and skinny or dead. I'm like, okay. I immediately began taking Mac completely out of the pasture and over to the garden area before giving him his bowl. And the garden is fenced, so he, he couldn't wander very far. He's easy to move from one place to another, especially when you have a food bowl in your hand and he's just jumping around happy, happy, happy. And so I got him into the garden and shut him in there so he could eat in private. And I gave Charlotte her bowl just over there back in the pasture, well away from the livestock again, so that she could eat. They could both eat in privacy. And Mac, <laughs> Mac always eats right away. 
and Charlotte did not. She's uh, she's a very smart girl, though. Uh, she only took one time of me picking up that bowl and walking away with it and not returning until the next day for her to learn that when I bring it, she needs to eat it. And we've not had a problem since. Uh, it was just her way of doing things. She might eat, she might not eat, you know. But with this setup, I needed to train her immediately that here's your food. If you don't eat it, I take it away. And she learned immediately. I had to do it one time, and that was it. Now, this change of feeding practice has changed everything. This change provided such an immediately productive outcome that I was, and still am, elated. I talk a lot about our challenges with one thing and another here on the homestead. You know, it's it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I wouldn't have another life, but there are lots of challenges and when one challenge is not only overcome, but produces this kind of productive outcome, I'm on cloud nine. I worry a lot. And so when things work out so quickly, I, I'm just, I'm thrilled. Within days of beginning this new free feeding regimen, these two dogs became the best of friends, more so than they ever had been before. Charlotte was immediately willing to work with and hang out with Mac. Up until then, she'd been kind of aloof. She hung out with them. They didn't, most of the time, they weren't fighting. It was only happening around the food. But they, they didn't really work together. And even better than that, she started becoming more friendly toward me. And let me talk about Charlotte. It, it now... It, moving from Mac to Charlotte. It has been a while since I, I talked about this, but all of our dogs have had some kind of issue that I deal with on a daily basis. And Charlotte's issue was that she would not let anyone near her. Just to get the vet to be able to examine her, we had to trap her into smaller and smaller areas just to get close enough to get, get a leash on her so that uh, we could take care of her. And uh, she is really, really a beautiful Great Pyrenees. And and I, and I just wanted to love on her. And it was frustrating. She would never let me get co close. And then a few weeks earlier, uh, the change between her and Mac, she started to, to, she started to change her attitude toward me as well. Now, oddly, she still runs away from me and won't let me touch her when I bring her food still. But when I come at any other time, uh, and even after she finishes her food and I come back to pick up her bowl, she lets me pet her now. She she will shy away if I move too quickly. But I'm so pleased to be able to actually pet her. And this morning, while I was out checking on the baby goats, more on that later, she actually put her paw on me to get my attention. While I was, I was looking away at the sheep, just kind of hanging, you know, with her, trying to get her... It's okay with me being there. She touched me. She twice she did this. I feel so blessed to have finally made so much progress with her. It has been just a little over a year since we got her, and finally she will let me love her. It's so wonderful. All right, now for the bombshell. Finn is back. Some of you are new and have no idea what I'm talking about here. Here's the scoop. Last year when we got Charlotte, another dog also came with the package. Some of you will remember him, but I'll recap here for all the newbies. Finn is an Anatolian Great Pyrenees cross. He's like a big cuddly bear. As I said, there are challenges with all of our dogs. They were all rehomed to us as adults, and as is common, they have not been the perfect livestock guardian dogs that we imagined. Many of the posts on the Livestock Guardian Dog Facebook page are about issues with rehomed or rescued dogs. And the consensus is that these dogs are always a roll of the dice as to whether they will actually work with your livestock and your operation. Uh, growing from a puppy is the best way. But it's just about the only option if you want an adult dog is to rehome or rescue the dog. Now, with a, a puppy, it's two years before they can be trusted alone with the livestock. There's a, They enter a teenage period and where they would have been fine with your uh, animals, they'll all of a sudden, they're... they're more playful they might hurt an animal they might kill an animal accidentally and then you know that's a whole learning curve so anyway two years old for them to be safe with your livestock now <laughs> Finn's vice uh, that's what I was talking about the Finn's vice is that he roams it was impossible to keep him inside our perimeter fence and that fence was built to contain goats 
which also have the reputation of being impossible to contain. But goats got nothing on a dog that loves to roam, on the livestock guardian dogs that want, that want to roam. In, in the first six months of his time with us, he escaped three or four times. Luckily, I had immediately, when we got them, when we got Finn and Charlotte, I got tags for all three of the dogs that have our farm name and no, a phone number printed on them. And um, actually, he may have even escaped more than four times. Now that I think about it, three times we got a call from a neighbor and looking at the tag that I'd put on him. And we, we had to go pick him up. He would get lost. One time he was around five miles away. And I'm pretty sure there were other times when um, he didn't go far and we were able to get him back home quickly. It's hard to remember. It's six months. Um, he was gone. And so much has happened since then. And it seemed like he escaped just about every day, and I think he—I think he did. He just—he didn't escape where we had to go get him. It, it was three, three times at least, maybe four. Uh, but he was escaping every day, just about. And about six months ago, he escaped and never returned. So we had him for six months, and then he was gone for six months, and then boom, he showed up. Um, there were no calls from a neighbor to tell us where to pick him up. And uh, up to that point, he'd never been gone for more than a day or two before someone called us. Um, yeah, six months ago. And we grieved the loss. Uh, Charlotte grieved the loss also. She was just, she didn't bark for two weeks. They were really close, the two of them. Um, they came from the same farm. And yeah, they were close. Then about a week ago, Scott found him walking along the fence line near in the road. It was easy to get him to come inside the fence. Yeah, he's a friendly dog. And he's... Now he's happily residing with Charlotte once again. And, I mean, is that not just the most amazing thing? Six months. And he just showed up. Now his tag with our farm name and number was missing. So I wondered, did someone keep him for themselves? He is a beautiful dog. Um, but I, re I, I never thought that was possible. I, honestly, I thought he'd gotten hit or, you know, tangled with a bear or something or a whole pack of coyotes that he couldn't handle. That's what I expected was that he had actually... Uh, been killed, but anyway, um, it, it, someone keeping him for themselves, it seemed impossible to me, because, as I said, he was impossible to contain, and he, he would have esca escaped from that person also, but we'll probably never know, um, now, he was covered with more cockleburrs than ever than I've ever seen, and his left eye is injured, he will not hold it, hold it open, and uh, so I tried a couple of times to cut out those cockleburrs, but he was having none of it. We were ex and uh, we were exploring ways to be able to get this done without him biting us. Uh, but then the the point became moot. He cleared those cockleburrs himself within two or three days. I have no idea how he got the giant mat of them that was up under his neck. I can see how he pulled them off of his legs, and I had successfully clipped a lot of them free from his back. Um, and there are still a few, but it is always good to know he's he's good at keeping his coat clean. And anyway, he's a little thin, and he has that issue with his eye. I'm monitoring that. But otherwise, he looks good. So uh, let me throw in a little other bit here, uh, because there's something else that happened with Mac. Just a few days, a few days before he returned, we had decided that Mac was simply not going to work with the sheep. And he kept charging at them to exert his dominance. Uh, he didn't really chase them, but he would bark and run toward them and just make a move. And then he'd stop and trot away. And uh, just exerting his dominance, I guess. Um, and then he killed a chicken. And that was sort of the last straw, though, it, in all honesty, it wasn't his fault. The chickens go anywhere they want. They won't stay in the fences where we have them. And they were close to the sheep and the dogs, and so they went in anyway. I, I was really worried in the beginning about him chasing them, but he didn't. He didn't really chase them at all. Charlotte was guarding chickens at the farm uh, when we picked her up, so I wasn't really worried about her. Um, anyway, it took about two weeks before my fear was realized, and I went down to feed him, and he didn't come when I called, and he's usually right there at the gate when he hears the door open. And I found him guarding his prize, resource guarding. <laughs> she was not quite dead, but, uh, but she was mortally wounded. So uh, we did process her, and... Uh, that was that was good to be able to save that for us. Uh, we put him back in with the cows and left Charlotte with the sheep. He had been with the cows before, and he's really great with the cows. And uh, Charlotte 
we put her in there alone. She was a little depressed for only a day or two, but then she was started doing really well with the sheep. Um, though she's actually afraid of them. Uh, she runs if they come too close to her or if it looks like they're coming at her. But um, she's staying in their general vicinity as they mosey around the pasture grazing. Uh, so when Finn returned, would we put him back in with her and the sheep? What else could we do? <laughs> they, we put them together. I, I didn't have another place to really put Finn. So, um, and she was in a paddock. She seemed okay there. Now she used to escape just about every day, also, but um, she seemed to be bonding with the sheep to the point of actively protecting them. Even if she still rode from them, and she stayed in the pasture with them, she wasn't escaping. And then when Finn arrived back on the scene, she went immediately up the hill where the sheep were grazing, and I thought, okay, this is good. She uh, she greeted Finn, but uh, she seemed to have no real interest in him at that point. I don't, I'm sure she knew who he was, but she, she wasn't bonded with him anymore. And so she returned to her job, and that was the first day. She went right back up the hill, and Finn stayed close by where we were. Um, anyway, it didn't last. A week later, she's warmed up to Finn again, and it's is uh, not really staying with the sheep anymore. <laughs> again, that was our original problem that led to the final escape of Finn when we were trying to give Mac a chance with the sheep. Um, so, but they were they were always more attached to each other than the livestock, and they bark so much more when they're together than Charlotte alone. So. Uh, and, and again, they both escaped regularly. And we were actually looking to rehome them and just work with Mac. Huh. And now Mac hasn't worked out. We're going in circles here. But, uh, so, most of the time when Finn and Charlotte escaped, Charlotte was always right back in the morning, or sometimes even in the same evening. And she'll, she still does that. She, if she gets, if she will get out. She can get out from anywhere without effort. And then, But she always stays close by. And every time we moved them to a new place where they'd never been, we spent days finding and fortifying their escape routes. And then they'd get out, and we'd find them and patch that, and then they'd get out, and so on. But she, <laughs> we were never able to contain her. But again, she didn't go far. Uh, now, on the fateful day when Finn escaped, we put them in the, in, when Finn escaped and didn't come back, we put them in the orchard while we moved Mac in with the sheep. And uh, this was the first time in there, and it wasn't fortified, and less than half an hour in the orchard, and they were gone. Charlotte returned before dark, and Finn was gone for six months. It is good to have him back, but we're back to square one. In the end, Mac didn't work out with the sheep any more than Finn and Charlotte, but the barking and the dogs, they do keep the predators uh, out of the area just by the noise that they make. I know I've rambled on and on about our defective livestock guardian dogs, and we may still have to make some hard decisions. And you probably realize at this point I'm really attached to all of them. Uh, now, only a week after his return, Finn has converted Charlotte back to her original self. She escapes and goes wherever she wants, never staying where we put her, not really staying with the sheep. She hangs with Finn. So far, Finn escaped a couple of times, but but we got him quickly before he got too far. And he seems to be secure at the moment after Scott spent some time patching up his escape locations. And not so with Charlotte. She could always get out, as I said, no matter what we did. But she's always right back, so not much of a worry. Without Finn, she had stopped that behavior. And uh, probably Finn will eventually escape again, and he may disappear again. So, enough of that. Enough of that. Let's talk about the goats. I'm not going to say a lot about the goats, uh, as the podcast will get too long. But I want to talk a bit about the chickens and the creamery also. So, uh, just a little bit here. We have had uh, our new registered 100% New Zealand Kiko goats for a little over a month ago. And again, I will go into all of that in a later podcast. Right now, I'm just going to introduce them. They're so cute. Ruark is the buck, and uh, the does are Amis and Leon. Now, all of those names might become familiar to you if you watch Amazon's Wheel of Time series. At least I hope they will. I'm not happy with what they're doing with my all-time favorite book series as they adapt it to the screen. It's not true to the books at all. And uh, those names may never appear in the screen adaptation. They change names and places and, and storylines. And anyway, um, there's always the books, though. 
But anyway, these are beautiful animals. My, I love my goats. They came from a great Kiko goat operation right here in Patrick County, Virginia. The farm owner is a wonderful woman with a wealth of knowledge about this breed of goat. And she has a couple hundred of them. And just a small challenge with new baby goats um, is getting them tamed down a little bit. We definitely didn't want to repeat of the last goats that we had. They ran wildly away from us for the first couple of years. And then after a couple of years of bringing them in, checking their health, and it was just a wild ride to even get them to be able to corral them. Uh, so this time we put the goats in, in uh, the goat kids in a 16 by 16 pen where we could begin to make friends with them before sending them out to the larger acreage where they could just run away. So the buck, um, the buck is now separated from the does. They're not old enough to breed, though at this point it is likely it's possible for them to breed. So we separated them. And the plan is to keep them separated for a few months until the does get old enough to be bred. So um, Ruark's in with one of the, um, we have an, uh, a lamb from this year that we put him in so there's two animals together and Ruark comes up to me he eats out of my hand um, I can't actually catch him up but he does not run wildly in er any every direction uh, when he sees me as they all did in the beginning and so he comes up to me uh, this plan has worked out really really well just this morning I let Leon and uh, Amis out of their pen into the paddock with the sheep in the larger area and I introduced the dogs to them both seemed quite, both of the dogs were really quite disinterested, so that was good. Um, Finn went up and sniffed them and, you know, was ob and then went away kind of disinterested. So um, it was important that I watch that they not hurt my new babies. And so far, so good. And that's, and that's all about I have to say about the goats right now at this point. I'll check on them in a few minutes, and I pray all is well on their first day out of captivity. But uh, I expect a good turnout there happy news with um, one thing at least uh, I'm moving on to the chickens to recap I have two breeds uh, black copper morans and American white breasts so the morans lay dark chocolate brown eggs and the breasts lay tan eggs and uh, they're not laying as many as I would like I was looking for more eggs but the jury's still out on whether we move forward with these breeds or switch to another I love these breeds but um, I was expecting more eggs according to the write-ups um, about them. So I hatched from eggs, 14 breasts and 9 morans. And when they reached maturity, we processed the excess roosters. We had a good, we had the perfect mix there. We, we needed 6 hens of each one and 2 roosters. Um, and so there were 8 breast roosters. We processed 6 of those. We were blessed with 6 moran hens out of the 9, exactly what I wanted. And we kept 2 of the 3 uh, roosters. So, But right now that rooster to hen ratio is way off. Um, whereas we see that we need lots more hens to support that many. We've got, we've got four roosters out there and 11 hens. So uh, that will come in the spring when we hatch out lots of baby chicks. We wanted to have backup roosters, but now I think that if we lose a rooster, rather than keeping that backup on hand, we could just buy another group of chicks and raise a new rooster. And that's likely the path we will take. In the next uh, processing cycle, we're going to downsize to just one rooster of each breed. Now, these are great chickens. Well, actually, I can say that about chickens in general. Chick chickens are very interesting create creatures, and they're easy to keep. If you've got even just the smallest yard, you can have two or three hens out there. Usually in the, in the suburbs, you can't keep roosters because they make too much noise. Even in HOAs, if they're quiet uh, and nobody knows about them, you can keep chickens. They're so easy. Uh, and then you, you have eggs. They don't have to have a rooster to, to lay eggs. Uh, now, the American white breasts are a special breed that has been bred to eat milk-soaked grain in the last two weeks before processing. Um, and then their meat becomes almost like marbled, like beef is marbled with fat. Or so they say. We haven't tried it. We processed that first batch without the milk-soaked feed. Uh, but we will be trying that again probably in the summer uh, when we process our first batch of meat chickens. And that's it for the chickens. I'm not going to talk about the garden and the orchard. They're going to sleep for the winter, and I do have some thoughts there, but not for this podcast. Um, let me finish up by talking about the progress on the creamery. Uh, we are nearing the end. The light at the end of the tunnel is now visible. Floors, electrical, plumbing, and hooking up the gas. Now that's going to finish it out. And I expect we will be USDA-inspected cheesemaking plant in the spring. Uh, that's about six years from start to finish on this project. We broke ground in the spring of 2017, and we expect to uh, 
be inspected in the spring of 2023. And without Scott's bout with cancer last year, it I wouldn't have been able to say five years. Um, at, but I'm so blessed he's fine now. So instead of five, it's just fine with me that it's six. It was a bit of a scare and a very tough season of life for him, but he is strong and healthy and continuing on with the crowning creation of his life. And I hope you'll visit once we open for business and see all that he's done. He's in a race right now with the weather. Winter's coming on. He's working on the tile floors and both the glue that holds the tile to the concrete and the grout that goes between the tiles are temperature sensitive. The temps need to be above 50 in order for the chemical processes to work effectively. As of today, he has all the tiles in place and is working on completing the grout. That's going to take several days. I'm not sure how many. He has probably posted about it on the locals page. It's hard for me to keep up with the exact days, especially when it can change on a daily basis if something goes awry and another task for the animals takes precedent. You know, because caring for the animals always comes first. So he might say three days and then we have to stop and catch up animals and fix a fence. But anyway, once he's completed those floors, I believe he will go back to the electrical. And if I remember correctly, he said he's about 50% done with the electrical. Then the next big thing which is the electrical won't take long to finish, I think. But the next big thing is going to be that plumbing. And he wanted to contract it out. And it's probably been nine months since he started trying to find someone to do the work. And it was like pulling teeth. Have you guys had this? No one was it was even willing to take on the job. No one had the time. We literally couldn't find a plumber. And then when we did find someone that was willing to give us a bid on doing the job, it was double what we expected to pay. Uh, we just found that out yesterday. Um, Scott's back to having to do it himself. And that means a lot more time with YouTube videos and phone consultations with his brother in Florida who knows about the project and, and what he might need. And it makes me kind of sad, but I know he will get through it. My Scott is a tough guy and very goal-oriented. He will get it done, whatever it takes. Um, and he does have one room that is sitting untouched right now, the large cheese cave. So that's not going to be completed until after the initial USDA inspection status is completed. We'll begin a complete operating business. Um, and then um, he'll have more time to just kind of slowly uh, put put that last room together. Once winter sets in, he, he's not able to do the tile in that room until the spring. And uh, until then, we have the small cheese cave that is currently functional and available right now. Whew, that was a lot, and I'm going to end it here. There is a lot more I could say, but uh, this has already gone way long. You can find lots more information on the Creamery posted on our Locals platform. That's PeacefulHeartFarm.Locals.com. Uh, Scott is always uploading videos of the animals and his work on the Creamery. Uh, that's it for today's podcast. It feels good to be back, guys. Things are slowing down for me for the winter, though there's still a lot to do, and I hope to get back on schedule with regular podcasts. Even in the winter, there are exciting things going on here at the homestead. Scott will continue his hectic schedule even through the winter. I am feeling the excitement of this project coming to fruition. And even with all the challenges of getting the cows bred and dealing with our less-than-perfect livestock guardian dogs, we keep putting one foot in front of the other. And I went on and on about the dogs I know, and there's still so much I did not say. I hope you enjoyed life on our homestead through my eyes and that you will continue to follow our journey as we build on our homestead dreams if you enjoyed this podcast please hop over to apple Podcasts, google play spotify or whatever podcasting service you use subscribe give us a five-star rating and and a review it really does help us get the uh, word out to more people uh, if you like this type of content and want to help us out, the absolute best way you can do that is to share it on all of your social media platforms. Share it with any family and friends who might be interested in this type of content. Let them know about Peaceful Heart Farmcast. It truly is the best way to really, really help us out. And come on over to our Locals community. Subscribe at PeacefulHeartFarm.Locals.com. We, we'd love to help you out by answering your questions in that forum. Um, I'll be posting another episode in the product series that I started on the Locals platform. Um, this is available to subscribers only, but the first one was on concentration and the next will be on developing, maintaining memory, and then there'll be one on imagination. See you there. Thank you so much for stopping by our homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.